And so what Paul speaks to, what conversion, what true change is, is that God has saved me and set, apart, uh, set me apart for himself. He has made me right, justified me with God. And so these are the things that we need to be communicating as change, which is that God makes us new people. And even in us being new people, we still have the same body. Therefore, we have the same struggles, the same temptations. But now we have a spirit that fills us with power that is able to help us to defeat and fight those things that we are tempted to leave God for. I mean, I guess we can start at the beginning, okay. which is, um, yeah, when I first started to notice uh, same-sex desires, it was me comparing how uh, other girls felt about little boys to how I was feeling, which was, oh, I like and want to get to know this little girl in the same way that these, you know, the other kids on the playground want to know the little boys and all the things. And I didn't know where it was coming from or why I was experiencing it. And I think if this was in early 90s, like if this was 2020, then I probably would have had a word to define myself by way earlier, <laughs> but it. I didn't. And so it was just within me. And so I went to church. I used to go to church with my Aunt Merle every Sunday. And uh, at some point I heard them preach or teach about homosexuality. And that was when I, like, I heard the behavior, then I heard the title and it's like, oh, this is what I'm experiencing. And, but I, I distinctively remember that the way they talked about it and the way they discussed it, it, it discussed the topic, it, it felt shameful mm -hmm. to be someone that would embrace it or experience it. And so I just kind of kept it to myself because it was like, this is clearly not something that Christians like. <laughs> this is not people that Christians esteem. Uh, and so let me just, you know, deal with these issues within myself until it got to a point where I couldn't keep it quiet anymore. There was no outlet mm -mm. Uh, in the 90s, okay? Well, you start winding back to the 80s and the 70s and 60s, it only gets worse. Yeah. You go back too far, there's laws and penalties, and you go back to the Old Testament, it's a death sentence. Right. Okay? So maybe um, what we need to do is, is realize that, you know, we've been saying it back in the back, we're, 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 talking about your book, mm -hmm. Gay Girl, Good God, but we're not, well, you could replace the gay word with pretty much anything. What about gossip? Mm -hmm. You know, it, see, sexuality doesn't send you to hell. Not knowing Jesus sends you to hell. Mm -hmm. So we've got to, we got to talk about this. Yeah. And, you know, you, you explain things in a way uh, that is testimonial in nature. This is what God did for you. So just walk us through, keep going. Let's get through this. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, when I was in high school is when it became harder to behave as a heterosexual where I had all these desires and all these feelings. And even in my friendships, I wanted it to be more than a friend, but I was so afraid of not only doing it, but admitting it to myself, Wow! <laughs> you know, because I didn't know what that meant. In the, the context I grew up in, it's like, this will send me to hell. Um, not even realizing that I already had a hell problem, yeah. th that I was, I was already a sinner. I, was, I wasn't even living righteous in the first place. Um, and so I just decided, I said, you know what? I'm just try it. I'm gonna just do what, you know, I do. And so I got on MySpace, <laughs> which was, ar is archaic now. <laughs> and um, I connected with a young lady. We ended up being in a relationship for around two years. In that time is what I transitioned into what in the black lesbian community is called a stud. And so a stud is the woman who kind of projects a kind of hyper-masculine self. And so I sag my pants, I would wear certain bras to flatten my chest, I put my hair in a ponytail, my voice is already heavy, didn't have to change that much. Um, and so there's also not only a sexuality uh, experience I'm having, but also a level of gender confusion. Um, and I think a lot of that was exacerbated by the culture because uh, I'm, I'm growing up in a world that says to be woman, to be girl is to like pink, to like purses, to, to wanna play with dolls. 
I didn't do any of that. And then what they call me, they call me tomboy. They are labeling me a different gender just on the basis of me not doing these socially constructed uh, definitions of womanhood and manhood. And I think we do the same thing to little boys. We say, oh, he's crying like a girl wow. instead of seeing his emotion as an expression of him being an image bearer, mm -hmm. right? And so I think so much of what I became and lived out was stuff that was spoken over me yeah. and confusion that I had ingested because no one had ever taught me um, that you can be your own kind of woman. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a wrestle. But at the same time, I enjoyed myself, uh, which I think people got to be honest, is that sin to a certain degree is enjoyable. It's not lasting. It's not eternal. But I was having fun, <laughs> you know. It was, it was. I, I felt at home with the women that I was with. I felt safe. I felt loved. I felt taken care of. And so that makes it even harder when you hear the call to repentance and for someone to say, "Well, this is unnatural," but it feels natural to me, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. so that sounds foreign, and it sounds like a lie for you to say, "I have to stop doing what's making me happy." It sounds foolish, which is what the gospel says, or what the scripture says, the gospel is. Okay, help us understand something. We, you know, we have this idea that sin sends you to hell. The church projects that. I don't know how that is, but okay. But the problem is you're born in sin. Short of understanding who Jesus is, who he was, what he did, died, resurrected, and ascended to the Father, and your belief in this, that is what transforms you. So why is there this singling out, let's say, of sexuality sin? Why are we singling it out? And why is the church projecting that a particular sin sends you to hell when not knowing Jesus sends you to hell? It's a big question. Uh, well, the wages of sin is death. And so sin does incur judgment from God. I think a part of the problem is that the way we read the scriptures is that we sometimes accuse people who are experiencing temptation of being actively sinful. So what I mean is that in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, it says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice how often we leave out practice. Oh, hey. We say homosexuals, which implies just your experience of the temptation warrants you hell. When it's like, but Jesus was tempted in every respect yet without sin. And so it is possible that someone can experience temptation and yet at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that that temptation warrants them hell. If anything, the temptation is a signpost that their nature, that there's a sinful nature, a flesh at work that needs to be renewed and needs to be put to death. Um, and so I just, I think it's, I think it's bad Bible reading. Yeah. But I think also the, um, kind of talking about sexuality all the time. We talked about this earlier, which is, I think it's, it's, it's so, it's easy to bully minority groups, okay? And so sexuality or those who experience gay sexuality have always been the minority group on the playground. And so they are the ones that are bullied. They are the ones that are talked about most. They are the ones that are spoken against most because if we speak against uh, heterosexual perverted ways of expressing sexuality. Now we're indicting the pastor and the deacons yeah. and the people in the church. So we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about we want to talk about the groups that are experiencing sexuality and expressing themselves in ways that we don't because that is a kind of self-righteousness. But also at the same time we have to acknowledge the fact that the church is often 
in our discipleship and evangelistic efforts, we are often responding to what the culture talks about most. And so if the culture is talking about gay identity and trans rights and all these things a lot, then the church naturally will discuss it a lot. And so I think it's a really complicated situation that we're in anytime we venture into a conversation about sex. Okay, so take a minute and talk about this issue in a way that let's just say the church was uncomfortable talking about or they shouldn't have been, but they were. What do we need to say on this program that hasn't been said? And I circle back to even something you said earlier. You said there wasn't a word that I could even describe myself. If I was five or six or seven years old in 2020, 2021, 2022, there might be a word that I might have been able to label myself with, but you didn't even have a word in 1990, yeah. you know, to, to label yourself. What, what do we as believers in Jesus and, the, and what that is need to say that hasn't been said? How do we help this situation? I think what we need to do is read the scriptures to listen to people three pray for wisdom um it is so much easier to go out and try to figure this thing out by yourself but we legitimately need the spirit of the living god and also know that this isn't strange. Uh, what's happening in Genesis 3, Eve is in the garden, minding her sanctified business. And the serpent steps up and says, hey, did God really say you shall not eat from the fruit of the tree? And she looks at the thing after conversing with, with the devil and she says, oh, that looks good for food. Oh, that's a delight to the, to the uh, eye. Oh, that's desire to make one wise. She has an affection for a created thing. She has a temptation to, 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 to take a part or uh, to engage with something that God told her not to. Mm -hmm. And so what is happening in the culture is what has always been happening, is that we have passions at war within us that are waging war against our souls. And so I think having that framework to know this isn't a random thing, nor is it something that you're also divorced from. Yeah. You have passions too, gay or straight. How many people do we know that are yet and still married and still tempted to be with someone that they're not married to? That is a passion that God calls us to put to death. And so, I don't know, man. We just, we need help. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's all done by the Holy Spirit. For sure. That's the only way we can do it. <laughs> because, you know, I, I think your part in labeling sin, you know, well, we have sweet Christians that are, are addicted to pornography. And or we have angry. sweet Christians that have road rage. Yeah. And we have sweet Christians. That are gossips. That are some of the worst yep. talkers that, that there can be. So I know... I know so much of that. I mean, so we were looking at Proverbs 6. Um, these six things the Lord hates. It's a strong word. <laughs> yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. That's now, I am of guilty of maybe a few of those. Yeah. Well, I think that this little list of things here, I'm just, I'm just curious as to why we elevate sexual sin over other sins and we, it's a confusing issue to me, yeah. for reals. <laughs> yeah, we're self-righteous and othering people makes us feel better about ourselves. There's an identity issue at play, and there's also a lack of compassion. It shouldn't excite you to condemn people. Yeah. It shouldn't give you joy yeah. 
to have to tell someone that they may not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that tells me that there's a lack of grief and mercy mm -hmm. at work in you, in that you are so prone to identify all of these bad people and never once say, woe is me. Yeah. You know? And so I, I, th I think we have a problem, but I, I also have to remind those who I've conversed with within the LBGTQ community is that some of the experience that, experiences that you have had with so-called Christians are actually not with real Christians. Mm -hmm. Because what is fruit of the Spirit? Right. Love, kindness, gentleness for one. Mm -hmm. And so if that is lacking consistently <laughs> and persistently, mm -hmm. then I have the right to question if you actually know God. Why? Because mm -hmm. God is mm -hmm. love. And so I've had to do the work of letting people within the gay community know, hey, some of the people you met don't actually know God, yeah. and I'm sorry. Yeah. But even in that work, I still have to define what is love then? Yeah. What is kindness then? What is compassion then? Because if their definition of compassion and kindness and love comes from the world, then it doesn't come from the scriptures. Wow. And so I can't also submit to how you see kindness because then I'll be unfaithful, right? And so mm -hmm. I, I, that's why I say I think it's a, it's a lesson in wisdom and prayer and redefining and clarifying that always has to be anchored in a love for the person rather than a boosting up of my own image. Yeah. Well, and, and, and taking up our cross. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a point where I just, I do it because the Bible says mm -hmm. to do it or not to do it. Yeah. Although your flesh is, you know, I'm, you know, and you, so what does that scripture mean to you? Yeah. Take up my cross. Taking up your cross. Daily. Upon, daily. One, it reminds me that crucifixion is constant. And that's a part of discipleship that is rarely communicated because we tell people come to Jesus, but we don't tell them that they have to die all the time. You know, like come to Jesus and you're going to get eternal life and it's going to be all good. It's like, yeah, but hard is the way <laughs> and few will find it that this walk, this, this walk comes with much suffering. And a bunch of that suffering is attached to me having to die to what feels so true and so real mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Uh, but it also means that crucifixion hurts. Yeah. And it also means that crucifixion takes time. Crucifixions historically were very long deaths. Mm. So it means that there are temptations and passions within me that I will have to put to death for a long time and may or may not be able to defeat them finally, but one day I will in glory. Right. And so I, I think that's what I see is that God has called me to be like himself, which is what our culture does not want to do. Mm -hmm. It does not enjoy dying to themselves because they think that in, in loving themselves that they will find life. Mm -hmm. But there's only life in Jesus. Mm -hmm. so. um, what Lori brought out in Proverbs 6, you know, would describe on any Sunday, virtually in any church, the majority of people sitting there. Everybody. Okay. Er All right. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Um, and it is so easy to carve out one particular sin and to label it in a way that all sin ultimately is what separated us from God. And you're either living with a temptation or denying yourself that, let's say, fruit, that, you know, this desirable fruit, whatever that is. I mean, it could be shopping, for goodness sakes. I mean, it could be gluttony, yeah. you know? We don't want to indict that issue yeah. because now we're indicting a lot of people. And, is you know, that's just an ugly thing to think about that you would... Um, really take the same steps to identify a separate group based upon a scale. Mm -hmm. But isn't that ultimately what the gay community is experiencing? What? A feeling of being separated, a feeling of being singled out and yeah. treated differently. Well, yeah, um, but I, I, I think one of the complicated things or interesting things or what di di differentiates 
those within the LBGTQ community from someone who's a shoplifter, for example, is this issue of identity. I, I think there, there is something difficult or something, we, I think freedom becomes difficult when we identify by our sins. And so what has happened is that the experience of a same-sex temptation or the practice of the behavior has now become an ontological thing where now this is my being. Mm-hmm. And so that's why repentance is even more offensive because to call you to turn from this behavior is heard by you as causing you, calling you to turn from yourself like who I am, my identity, who God created me to be. But the fundamental identity that we all share and have is that of an image bearer. What does that mean? It means that I was created to image God, not to, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that makes this whole thing really hard is that people have identified by their sins and they're proud about it rather than being willing to take up their cross and die daily and identify themselves with the sun. Okay. You just um, described that there's fault on both sides. Mm-hmm. The church doesn't want to indict everybody in the congregation. So the pastor doesn't indict everybody about a proud look every Sunday and about sowing discord and being a gossip and swiftly running to evil. So you don't, you don't want to indict everybody, but at the same time, the gay community is saying, wait a second, this is who I am. Right. Okay. Where a shoplifter doesn't just get to say, Hey, this is who I am and just deal with it. Okay. So, um, the, it's a complex issue, right. but there's fault really on both sides. Absolutely. Okay. So in that and what you just explained and what you lived out and what you're living out and what you're proving out is that until Jesus comes into somebody and, and, and until somebody is calling upon that, they're really saying or what what somebody has said like like we're sitting here saying there is a change available for you but prior to 2008 you would have said no 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 this is who I am yes or no I, I was raised in the church so I was a little careful with my words I was scared okay but go ahead but well <laughs> okay but Let's, yes to a certain degree okay. it, this is very much Jackie and to deny this part of me is to lay aside me, for, for lack of better words. Okay. Yeah. So then, ultimately, someone might label you then someone that is trying to change who somebody is. Which is true. Okay. Talk about that for a minute. We just have to define what change is. Okay, well, it, <laughs> help me with that. Let's go. <laughs> because God has every intention to change who we are. Yeah. We are by nature children of wrath. We are uh, born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And God has every intention to create us again, to make us new creatures, to give us the right to become children of God. And so the Bible is all about change, all about conversion. It's just the way we've communicated as Christians has been unbiblical. For example, we've told people, hey, if you come to Jesus, what change looks like for you is that he'll make you straight. Mm. As if heterosexuality is a fruit of the spirit. But I've never seen that in Galatians 5. I don't see that nowhere in Romans 6. <laughs> what, what I see, even in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, which I quoted earlier, we leave out verse 11. So again, uh, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor swindlers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God, verse 11. But such were some of you. But he does not say, and you were made straight. He says you were sanctified, mm-hmm. you were justified, and you're glorified. Uh, 
I'm missing one, <laughs> by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. And so what Paul speaks to, what conversion, what true change is, is that God has saved me and set, apart, uh, set me apart for himself. He has made me right, justified me with God. And so these are the things that we need to be communicating as change, which is that God makes us new people. And even in us being new people, we still have the same body. Therefore, we have the same struggles, the same temptations. But now we have a spirit that fills us with power that is able to help us to defeat and fight those things that we are tempted to leave God for. I imagine that if that is the way that we communicated change, we would actually have more conversions yeah. because now we've preached a real gospel mm -hmm. and not a prosperity gospel because it is a kind of prosperity gospel to say, hey, come to Jesus and he'll make you straight, implying you can come to Jesus and be temptationless. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus didn't have that kind of life. Right. <laughs> so we want to tell people what it really means to be a Christian, which is you're going to struggle, but you're not going to struggle forever. And you're going to pick up your cross and follow me. For sure. And so there's this weird kind of discussion that doesn't get talked about very much, that if somebody is struggling with sin, then they're identified as that. Mm. Well, who isn't struggling with being angry or this or, you know, or, you know, I mean, my dad told the story of his own father who left the foal and got on a horse and wanted to become a professional gambler. <laughs> okay. This is when, before automobiles and the whole time. And he was in, I guess, a saloon and, and was playing cards and the, the, okay, he was involved in alcoholism. He was involved in wanting to run away. And when he finally surrendered at the, at the knee of his grandmother, mm -hmm. okay, my dad's dad, and, and she prayed and, and he actually received Jesus, quote, he didn't want to drink again. He didn't want, and it was called into the ministry and all this. Yeah. So sometimes we get this conversion experience confused, uh, and we say to somebody, the moment you surrender to Jesus, you're just not going to be tempted anymore. Mm. And what's your problem? Mm. Yeah. And, and if you're having a problem converting from gay to straight, for example, then that's on you. Yeah. Because, because we've made heterosexuality the, equivalent of, the, spirit. the equivalent of holiness. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same because we are all sexual. First of all, heterosexuality and homosexuality are even categories that have not existed prior to 1800. And so we're already dealing with contemporary ways of seeing our sexuality, okay? Um, but I think beyond that, it's that we are all sexual beings, but we are also sinful. Therefore, we are all sexually broken. And so it is unhelpful for me to assume that for you to become straight is equivalent to you being holy. It's not. So what we need to say is, no, you need to come to Jesus. You need to love Jesus and serve Jesus. I've had so many conversations with people where they have told me, Jackie, I have tried to be straight. I've tried, I, I got married to a woman. I got married to a man. I, I did all this stuff and it never worked. And my question is, but did you ever try to love Jesus? Mm -hmm. That's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because if you are coming to Jesus to be straight, then you are not coming to Jesus for Jesus. Therefore, you have only in inherited another idol. And that's not what we want. We want legitimate, legitimate conversion, legitimate conversion where the spirit of God and Jesus's righteousness is imputed to you. And now you love him more than anything, even when you struggle with everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth of the matter. But we have hope to him who was able to keep us from stumbling, to present us faultless Come and blameless on. for his glorious presence with great joy. It's like we, this tension between our bodies and our hearts and our passions and our minds will not always exist you know, but if we are a slave to that now and refuse to repent, we will be a slave to it forever. Oh I, I love you. I love oh when you get going God. like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, and we, so, so the power of the cross and what Jesus did for us at the cross takes away all the excuses. It does. 
because he, he, he really has made, he really has made a way. And um, it's so offensive, it's so offensive to say um, that who or what you believe is so true of yourself is wrong. And I, I do understand that, I, I understand it. But where are we getting even that framework? Is it from God? Is it from the apostles? Is it from the prophets? If anything, what, what the scriptures are saying is we live in a place where everything, everybody does what is right in their own eyes mm -hmm. and that our hearts are deceitful above all things. Who can possibly know it? And so we need a transcendent wisdom that is not dependent on what the culture believes is right, but what, what has been revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and is that he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And he has risen from the dead so he could give life to our mortal bodies and give us the power to raise above all the things that are relegating us to death. And so it is an offensive gospel, but it is the power of God unto salvation for those who by the power of the spirit choose to believe it. And so we have no choice but to preach this thing that makes some people mad and makes other people saints. <laughs> That's our predicament. So the idea that we make an idol of either homosexuality or heterosexuality mm -hmm. is just a it's just trading one idol for another. Yeah, neither will save you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so the idea that that Jesus is the only true goal here. Yeah. And if, if and the holiness of 2007 God. Jackie Hill Perry didn't understand. Jackie Hill. <laughs> yeah, it was Jackie Hill. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Jackie Hill. 2007 Jackie Hill uh, didn't understand that basically what you were going to get when you got Jesus. Mm. Yeah. So so what changed? How did how did you become who you are today? Mm -hmm. And what was the what was the impetus mm -hmm. for you understanding the purity and the love of Jesus that would never let you down? How did that finally come about? Well, one um it sounds silly. But I really do think Sunday school was, is partially to blame mm -hmm. because they taught me really basic truths about Jesus. Mm -hmm. They had me, you know, colored a little paper with Jesus and the little lambs. Mm -hmm. And they told us John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. And it's those really simple but fundamental gospel truths that actually did something to my conscience during the whole thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to continue to sin when you know the truth. And so it got to a point where I was just convicted all the time and it was getting on my nerves. You hear me, Lord? It was yeah. getting on my nerves. <laughs> I was always reminded that God wanted me, that God died for me, that God was displeased with my sin. And I called my cousin Keisha because she was the only Christian that I had a relationship with that would actually have a conversation. Like I knew if I called her, we wouldn't go uh, uh, like to Leviticus 18 immediately and oh. Romans 1. Like she would actually ask me about my dad. And so <laughs> I called her, uh, which is a word that you want to be the kind of Christian uh, that treats people like image bearers and not people to be fixed. And I sensed that from her. So I called her, I said, hey, I feel like God is calling me, uh, but I don't want him. Like, I'm really enjoying my life. I don't, I don't want to be a Christian. And she said something that made no sense to me at the time. She said, uh, God is going to show you how much you need him. I was like, okay, whatever. So I got off the phone. And my life started to get a little difficult, which I think was God's providence allowing suffering to force my, my head to look up and say, oh man, life isn't as good and as easy and as lovely as I want it to be. And so I would do what I usually did, was to smoke a bunch of weed to get some sort of peace until, eight, <laughs> <laughs> until October 2008. I'm 19, I'm in my room, minding my business, not doing nothing spiritual because I didn't go to church. Christians always looked at me weird and so I didn't like to go into their world. And so God brought him, his spirit into 
to mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in my room and I heard a thought and it was, she will be the death of you. And it was weird because I was like, wait, like, first of all, I wouldn't say that to myself. Don't think the devil would. So maybe it's the Lord. And so I started to have this conversation with God and my immediate response to God was, but I don't want to be straight. Because again, the gospel message I had heard is that to be Christian is to be straight. Not to be, is to, not to be Christian is to be holy. And so I just was like, God, I, but I don't want to be straight though. And I felt God speak to my heart and say, just learn to love me and we'll work everything else, else out. And so I started to think about my life and everything that I loved and enjoyed. I thought about my marijuana addiction, my theft, my uh, disrespect of authority figures in all forms, my idolatry, my uh, just every, every single thing that I loved and enjoyed had nothing to do with the glory of God. And at that moment, I realized that my only, like my primary issue was not my sexuality, but my unbelief. It was that I lived my life for myself. I did whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it, which is utterly rebellious against the living God. But at the same time, I remember John 3, 16, which said, oh, so when you said, for God so loved the world that whoever believed, you were talking about me too, <laughs> that, that I'm the person that if I believe that I'll have eternal life. And so that's really what happened is that I realized, okay, if God is presenting himself as an alternative to everything that I love and enjoy, he must be better than everything that I've loved and enjoyed thus far. <laughs> and so in my repentance, it wasn't me, oh, let me be a good person or let me escape hell, is that I literally found through the power of the Holy Spirit, the fountain of living waters. Mm -hmm. That I, it was just, it was second Corinthians that the veil was being lifted from my eyes for me to see the glory that is in the face of Jesus Christ. And I did not know that was repentance. I did not know that was faith, but I do know that I was different immediately. Wow. <laughs> so that's what happened is that the Lord saved me, child. Yes. That, that wasn't, that wasn't none of my works lest I boast. Wow. Truly. <sighs> okay. Sorry, it was a mouthful. No, that I love was it. that was that was amazing. Beautiful. And you it feels like you were just seeing again, the scales came from your eyes. You were seeing something you didn't experience in church hmm. except in Sunday school. So that seed didn't return void in your life. It's almost like you came back to that. But everything from the time you felt the same sex attraction at five, six, seven years right. old, you don't really remember, uh, until that time, you s saw nothing modeled in the church that drew you there. Well, I did in my Aunt Merle. She was, I always say she's the first holy woman I knew because mm -hmm. she lived so differently than everybody else. She was just kind all the time. She did wear dresses all the time. I was like, I, I ain't never gonna be that holy. But she was just different, but I didn't have a theological framework that how she lived was a product of a supernatural conversion that God himself did. Got it. So, Because I, I thought Christians were people that were just really good at doing the right thing. Oh. They never told me that it is God that raises you from the dead, yeah. that it's God that makes you righteous, that it's God that make you, makes you new. And so I, I think if I was able, if like somebody communicated that to me, instead of just stop sinning, stop dressing like a boy, stop listening to secular music, they were giving me all these works and they were never giving me Jesus. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that's, that was, there was a disconnect between what I saw and what they taught. So it was all about do good, get good. Yes. Do bad, get bad. It. Or go to the altar and cry yeah. for 10 minutes, you know, say this prayer. But it's like, but, all but I don't have itself. any faith. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm saying the prayer, but I'm not even believing in anybody yeah. when I'm doing it. I'm thinking that the prayer itself has the power unto sal salvation and not the power of God through his gospel. Mm. So the gospel was never explained to you in a way until supernaturally yeah. a conversation that stemmed from John 3, 16 from Sunday school, you jumped off of that and went into a conversation that ultimately got your attention. Damascus. Yeah. 
Wow. So. That's beautiful, by the way. It is. Because that means it can happen to anybody. Yeah, wherever they are. Yeah. And I, th and I think it's encouraging to parents yes, because you absolutely. really do think that all that you poured isn't working. Yeah. That it, it's not it's not landed, that the seed has been sown, but the, the devil done plucked it up and perhaps for a time. But just because they're not responding to what you taught doesn't mean that they don't remember it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of the spirit of God is that he, he's going to use that word. We don't know when, but we just keep praying that the word that you sowed, that God would use other means to water it so that there's fruit. And to break the shame off of people's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, God is so good. And I think the, the thing that he hates about sin so much is that sin leads to death. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so why did I send my son mm. to die? Mm. You know, and we put so little into what the blood of Christ actually did for us. Yeah. And we have all these excuses because we don't see the glory and the holiness of God, which you've got another book yeah. <laughs> called Holier Than Thou. That is just amazing. Um, but his grace See, seeing him face to face, seeing his okay. uh, love. I, th I think I could say it, but I want to, I, I think I could say it, but I want you to. <laughs> say it better. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't want to jump in and put words in your mouth. What was the main obstacle in 2007 between you and a loving Jesus savior that you recognize and acknowledge now? What was the biggest obstacle? Apart from spiritual blindness, well, that's, the, that's the automatic. I just don't think I was given a framework about the beauty of God, you know? Like it was God is Lord, God is King, God is judge, and these are all true. But is he beautiful? Hmm. If, I, if, I, if I relinquish everything, is there joy on the other side? Hmm. Or is it just duty? <laughs> and and I, I don't think that's the Christian faith. I, I think the Christian faith is that we are being reconciled to the God of all comfort, that at his right hand is joy forevermore, that for the joy that was set before him, what was the joy set before him? Being back with his father. And so I think that's what I was missing is that people were telling me to repent, but they were not giving me a God that was worthy of my repentance. Mm -hmm. Wow. It just... You it don't want feels, to go to hell. It nope. feels like what you've done today is started telling that story to our audience. If somebody wants to accept Jesus, how, how do they do that? If, if they're, you know, help, help them. Just your camera's back off that way with the red light. Yeah, I mean, one, the want is a gift. <laughs> the, the desire to want to know and love and serve God more is, is only something that the Holy Spirit has produced in you. But the truth is, is that we have a problem in the way and the problem is our heart. The problem is sin. The problem is that we are slaves to it. But God and His holiness knows that that's a problem that we cannot fix. And so He sends His Son, who was God in the flesh, to live the righteous, pure, unblemished life that God has called you to, but that you failed at. Uh, and this Jesus went to the cross and took on the penalty of your sin, died and rose, also allowing you to have power over your sin. And so now your call is to repent, to turn from your sin and to turn towards Jesus in faith, believing that He is all that He says that He is and that He will do all that He says that He will do. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you will be risen from the dead, given new life, united with Christ, and you stir that up and you build yourself up in your most holy faith by going to somebody's good church, getting in that good Bible and doing you some good prayer. And I pray that, uh, yeah, I pray that that's helpful. How do they, if somebody is literally flipping the channels and there you are sitting there, they've been listening for the last, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Is it the words they need to say? How, how, what, what should they say in their room or help them pray that prayer, if you would? Honestly, I would rather them just be honest. Be honest. I don't, I don't know if the psalmist had a guide all the time or a script, uh, but what they did have is they know themselves enough to know where they're guilty and they know themselves enough to know what they need from God. And so to simply confess that as you would any friend, mm -hmm. hey, uh, this is where I am mm -hmm. and this is what I need. And, but the difference is, is that with a friend, they can't really supply your needs in the same way that God can. And so there's a level of faith that says, okay, I'm confessing to somebody who has the power to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say is confess, be honest and believe that God is actually able to respond in the way that is suitable to his nature, that will help you, in you for your good and that will glorify his son. You described a conversation that you had with God and you described it as kind of starting with something you learned in Sunday school, God, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means me. Mm -hmm. Were you saved that night? Yes. But the crazy thing is I didn't know that. I went to bed, I was tired and I woke up and I, I went to church. And the one odd thing is that I had a peace that I could not explain. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it, was, it was just this, peace means whole. It, there was this wholeness in my mind and all the things. And uh, my best friend used to work with me. And again, I'm dressed just like Jackie, cause you know, I might've been saved, but my closet wasn't yet. And so <laughs> I'm still looking just like me. And he said, you look different. And I really- The next morning. The next day. And I, I think what he saw was that the veil had been removed, truly. But then I get behind the register again. I worked at a fast food restaurant and this young lady walked up and she was attractive. And uh, two days before, I would have tried to get her attention to try to see you know, if she was gay, if she would go, all the things. And I had this awareness of God that I had never had before. And it wasn't like before that, I didn't think that God could see everything. I knew that from church, that God saw all things. It was just that this time, for the first time in my life, I cared. And that was the first evidence that to be converted, to be a Christian was not the absence and temptation, but the imputation of reverence. Mm. I cared mm. that God could see my heart. And I ain't know no Bible verses. I ain't know no hymns. I ain't know no CCM, no gospel, no nothing. But I just knew help. And I said, God, help me. <laughs> and he helped me. <laughs> so that was just, that was the immediate sign to me that I am not who I was yesterday. Wow. And I have not been who I was, was, was it now, 13 years. Wow. So. And God wants to do that. God wants to help everybody. <laughs> yeah. Every day. The, Every day. The, that's the testimony of the church. That's all of us. So the gospel was good news finally to you. <laughs> yeah. Finally, somehow. Yeah. And make sure somebody understands that what you're talking about is good news? Man, it's good news because imagine life without it. So imagine if, as like we talked about Adam and Eve earlier, imagine if after Adam, we've inherited his nature, we are sinners, and we just going about doing whatever, going to all these broken cisterns that ain't, that ain't got no water in them, wondering why we still thirsty, and we die, and then there's nothing but judgment because of it. Like, that's really bad news, yeah. <laughs> you know? But for there to be, even immediately after Adam sins, later on in Genesis 3, God promises that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Even immediately after sin, God preaches the gospel and says, you know what? This ain't going to be the end, though. I'm going to send someone who's going to deal with this problem at hand. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's good news. It's, the good news is that how we are doesn't have to be who we will become. We can and be made into new people and actually love it and enjoy it, you know? Like, that's the truth. And beyond all of that, when we die, 
will see God. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself is the ultimate fruit of the good news is that we will live with God forever. We will be not in Eden, but in New Jerusalem, mm -hmm. a garden that Satan can't get into because yeah. there will be no sin. There will be no suffering. There will be no death. There will be no fear. There will be no tears. There won't even be lamps and light and the sun because the glory of God is our light. And so that, I don't, if that ain't good news, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, the thing that you just said, that God was there to help me. That's, what, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. It is. You know, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It says, the Bible says it lives in us. Yeah. You know, and, and we're not on our own. And it's not just doing all the do's and the don'ts of the Bible. It's being transformed and God there to help us. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. We're, not on, we're not left alone. Yeah, he's our great high priest. He, yes. Okay. So that's great news. My takeaway good news. is <laughs> heterosexuality <laughs> is not a fruit of the spirit. It's not. Self-control is. Self-control. Self-control. <laughs> and he was there to help you that next day with that temptation that you lived with. Yeah. And he still is. Yeah. You know, um, I think now that I've, I've, I've walked with God, I'm, I'm te technically a teenager in the flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, but where I am now is that I real, I'm realizing that I just have bigger fish to fry than that. You know, there are levels and complexities to my pride that are just always coming out where it's like, man, uh, even the, the woman that discipled me, she said, Jackie, sexuality is not your only pride problem. You need to learn how to love God and die to the flesh in every aspect of your life. So even in our discipleship, making sexuality central continues to serve the narrative that our sexuality is who we are. But we're more complicated than that. There's so much, there's so much more of us that has problems, but also so much more of us that needs to grow. And so, yeah, God is, God is faithful to his people. Yes, he is. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.